Hi everyone, this is Dr. Heather Austin Robillard and this lecture video is going to go over group therapies and self-help groups. In this lecture video, you will be introduced to, to two of the popular methods of treatment for addictive disorders, one being group therapy and the other one being self-help groups. These two treatment options do have similarities, but they have some very key differences that relate to the presence of mental health professionals. In this lecture, we will go over group therapy, what it is, who runs the group, the structure of group, and the role of the mental health professional. Then it will transition to self-help groups, particularly focusing on introducing you to the different self-help groups that exist today for addictive disorders. We'll learn about the assumptions, traditions, and services offered by these different groups. We will also learn about how clients can select the best self-help group for them. Group therapy is designed to help individuals learn how to think, act, and feel within a group setting where they are also able to support and learn from one another with the guidance of a mental health professional. In treatment, there is usually a mixture of individual and group therapy. The different groups can be process or even some psychoeducational groups. Uh, the process groups are usually there to process emotions and to teach about addiction, coping skills, and other life, life skills. The group should share, care, and work to help one another grow. Each member must be active in their participation in sharing and they must be open to listen to others and talk. And people in the group must be able to work authentic to who they are to receive the help that is needed. Group is also confidential, similar to individual therapy. What is said in group stays in group. Participants must sign contracts just like they do to enter into family or individual therapy. And there are a set of guidelines in the group to follow and keep safety in mind, such as no physical violence. Most, why is group a beneficial option? Group gives individuals the opportunity to interact with others who might share similar presenting problems um, in the group. They learn from this that they are not alone in their pain and that they can help decrease the power of stigma for their presenting problems that is likely felt in society. Members tend to gain a sense of hope um, from witnessing others who are farther along in the treatment process, such as reaching a goal that is possible based on her story, if she can get there, so can I. Group can also establish an environment where, where people learn how to communicate in a healthy manner, and they may not always have friends and family willing to come to therapy to allow these skills to be developed with a mental health professional, so they're able to do it with their group members. Group members also tend to learn from one another. Group members tend to also learn from one another. They can learn from their successes or their failures. It's just a great way to kind of learn about those experiences. For groups to be successful and a safe place, uh, the professionals running the group need to create structure, safety, and cohesion, and create an environment that allows for both being challenged, but also supported by the group members. For safety, the professionals create a set of rules and may allow the group members to help create these rules. But once created, the group must follow the rules. Each group typically starts with the review of the rules and an acknowledgement for each member present that they agree to the following rules. For example, I used to teach or I used to facilitate an eating disorder group, and one of the rules that um, the facilitators and the group members came up with was that we don't talk about um, losing or gaining weight in the group. This just kind of was a good way to reduce any triggers within the group. Another important aspect of group therapy is confrontation versus support. This is an issue that comes up in other therapeutic settings, but is important to address here. Because of the interaction of multiple members, the professional has to help teach group members the difference between confrontation and support and how they appropriately challenge others in the groups. Um, and when to just provide support. It's really important for members to support one another in their decisions, but they are also here to grow. And if they present an idea that is not ideal for creating growth, 
a group member should be able to call them on this, but do so in a way that is not harmful. That can be asking a lot from a group member, so the professional may need to intervene and help in these moments. Going along with this, what are the roles of the therapist? Having a pro professional present in group therapy is what distinguishes group therapy from self-help groups. The professional serves some very key roles that include helping to enforce and maintain the structure and safety of the group. They provide an expertise as a therapist. For example, helping um, to challenge or push a client in the moments that the other group members do not know how to or provide a level in, of insight that they may be above the current uh, group member's ability. The professional also provides um, the professional also models healthy communication and helps show an appropriate way to challenge a group member. The professional is also the one that holds each group member accountable for the group rules. They are the one that makes sure to keep the person from oversharing or from taking up more time than anyone else, like dominating the group. It helps to engage members who are not engaged in sharing the group. Now that we know that the difference between group therapy and self-help group is primarily that there's a mental health professional, let's look at what a self-help group does. Many individuals, especially those who struggle with addiction, seek help from a self-help group or a mutual help group instead of seeking the help of a mental health professional. These groups differ from psychotherapy groups in that they are voluntarily groups run by members of the group and they are self-governed. Changes develop from the process of mutual and reciprocal helping in that each group member brings something to the table that might offer insight into changing someone's views or behaviors. Change is predominantly viewed as occurring due to the social support received from the group participation, so it's that fellowship. These groups tend to be free, and a very well-known group is the Alcohol Alcoholics Anonymous, or AA, and many of these groups that exist today are founded in the 12 steps that emerge from AA. These groups include but are not limited to um, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, Gam Gamblers Anonymous, Sex and Love Addiction Anonymous, Al-Anon and Families Anonymous. As mentioned previously, AA is one of the most well-known self-help groups, particularly for the addiction and recovery community. AA was founded in 1935 and was based on the Oxford group a religious movement popular in US and Europe. The Oxford group practiced a formula of self-improvement by performing self-inventory, admitting their wrongs and making amends, and using prayer and meditation. Roland H. went to a psychoanalyst for help with his alcoholism and was told that the only re relief he would find was through spiritual experience and sent him to the Oxford group. While working with the Oxford group and he and several other men were able to abstain by practicing the Oxford principles. This was the start in the roots of AA. AA has one main text, which is the big book, but also has the, twex, the text 12 and 12. The AA movement is based on members helping members and they identify as being spiritual, but not actually a religious group. Although the AA groups are based on Christian principles. Along with the 12 steps, there are also 12 traditions of AA. These traditions include anonymity for all, being self-sufficient, helping others stop drinking, not engaging in public controversy, not having public opinions, group purpose is one ultimate authority, leaders are servants and not, and no one governs. The advantages and disadvantages can be seen that way depending on the person and the level of service is needed. The groups are run by lay people or not professionals, and while this can be a, a disadvantage, men, many individuals seeking recover, recovery consider this an advantage as the persons they are working through have actually lived similar experiences and know addiction firsthand. The group tends to be very homo homogeneous or without little with little diversity. There is a lot of rigidity and a pressure to reach recovery in the way that AA sees recovery. Lifetime abstinence, turning it over to their higher power and admitting powerlessness. 
There are also very rigid beliefs about what should be abstained from and the members can be kicked out or chips taken away based on these views. The groups are self-supporting and do not take funds from other organizations or outside services. The groups are also free and readily available, so locating a group should be easy for most people. People receive rewards or chips as a token to show their achievements within recovery. These are the points of pride and help give a tangible reminder of all that the person has achieved in their recovery. Group support is the key component of membership to help other alcoholics. Spirituality is based on Christian leaning, so some individuals who struggle with the idea of how higher power identify as agnostic or atheist may feel uncomfortable or go against the idea of giving it over to their higher power. For others, this is an advantage to the group. I'll let you go over what the 12 steps actually are, but in treatment, clients will work through these stages on an individual basis, but commonly individuals in treatment would work through steps one through three in shorter programs or one through five in longer programs. Step one is usually addressed in the group settings, group therapy of some form, which is surrendered to the and admit to powerlessness. If a client was being recommended to attend group by a professional, it is first very important to make sure that the client is selecting a group that fits their best needs. Ask the client what types of meetings are available to them and where they live, how easy it is to fit those meetings in, like between um, lunch or after work, how comfortable they are at giving their number, um, since many groups may ask them to give number to someone in the group, Evaluate if group treatment is a healthy option for them. Once they have selected a group type, help prepare them for what is the particular group or self-help group will be like. If they go not knowing what to expect, they may never seek a group treatment option again. Rational recovery is the direct counterpart to AA. In the creators of RR, they speak out against AA and are clear in that they do not believe AA and believe that AA is seeking to keep from drinking only because of moral injunction. Their website seeks stories from individuals who are willing to let RR fight the fight against AA for them and encourage seeking civil suits against AA. The founder is Jack Trimpey, a recovered alcoholic and licensed social worker. The organization is trademarked and for-profit. The change process is based on rational, emotive therapy and does not promote a lifetime of abstinence. Their treatment is based on what they call AVRT, Addictive Voice Recognition Technique, that helps those seeking recovery identify their addictive voice or the voice that tells them, supports, or suggests the possible use of drugs or alcohol. Their view of addiction is that it is persistent, it is a persistent use of substance despite their own better judgment and pushes for personal acceptance of their decisions to use. The assumption of this model includes that the view of alcoholism or addiction is not a disease, but a voluntary behavior. It discourages the idea of the forever recovering drunk or addict, that once you have abstained, you are recovered. There are no self-help recovery groups and the emphasis is on self-efficacy. There are no discrete steps and no considerations of spirituality. Secular Organizations for Sobriety, or SOS, was founded in 1985 by James Christopher, a sober alcoholic since 1978. This organization was intended as an alternative for people struggling with spiritual concepts, and it stresses personal responsibility for one's actions. SOS does not see themselves as in competition with or opposition to any other part of recovery, but stands as an additional option an individual may choose. They do believe that individuals reach recovery, but they are never cured, and that relapse is typically a part of a recovery process. Thus, an individual may experience relapse. The group also offers anonymity and also focuses on abstinence from all substances. There are six guidelines offered by SOS to help their members achieve recovery. One, the individual must break the cycle by acknowledging their addiction. They must reaffirm daily that they cannot use no matter what. They must take whatever step necessary to continue their sobriety priority. The good life can be achieved but filled with uncertainty, so don't use regardless of the circumstance. 
sharing confidence with each other, and sobriety is priority, each responsible for their own life. In Women for Sobriety, Jean Kirkpatrick was the developer of the nonprofit organization in 1976. Women for Sobriety was the first national self-help group program for women alcoholics. This program acknowledged that women need something different than males to help them be successful in seeking recovery. The philosophy is based on being supportive, nurturing, and creating a safe environment for women to face their addiction. The organization stresses abstinence and uses cognitive behavioral therapy techniques. The moderator or the group leader is required to have at least one year of sobriety and also be a certified group leader. There are three tenets of assumptions and, the, and these help women to reach the six levels of growth. Some examples of the 13 tenets include the past is gone forever, I am what I think, I am responsible for myself and my actions, and negative thoughts destroy myself. Through each of these affirmations, there is a secondary piece to be stated or acknowledged in the acceptance of the 13 tenets. Members are encouraged to arise each morning 15 minutes early to go over each of the 13th affirmations and to reflect on each tenet. Additionally, there are six levels of growth, which include accepting the physical nature of alcoholism, remove negativity, learn to think better of themselves, change their attitudes, improve relationships, and change life priorities. Self-Management and Recovery Training, or SMART, was originally part of the um, recovery rationale movement, but split away in 1994. From RR to stay nonprofit or a free online support. Recognized and as being secular science-based alternative to 12-step groups and is not limited to alcohol or drugs, includes support for behavioral addictions. Both using cognitive behavioral therapy and rational emotive behavior therapy in order to create change. There are four areas um, focused on in the recovery process. Building motivation or learning to abstain. The difference from AA in there is that there is no need to admit powerlessness, that once the person sees they need to change, they can learn how to do so without being powerless. Coping with urges and cravings. Problem solving, finding rational ways to manage our thoughts and behaviors and feelings. Lifestyle balance, both short term and long term. Members meet once or twice a week for 90 minutes. There are no requirements of religious or spiritual um, beliefs in order to achieve recovery. And they also support the use of psychological treatments and legally prescribed psychiatric medications, unlike other self-help groups. The SMART stages of change application. In pre-contemplation, the individual has not realized that they have a problem. In the contemplation stage, the individual performs those cost-benefit analysis about the continued use of their addiction, behavior, or substance. In the preparation stage, the individual will complete the change plan worksheet available online. In the action stage, the individual can focus on either self-help or seeking a professional, in the maintenance stage, the individual will, will be encouraged to focus on what behavior changes have been made over the course of a few months of abstinence. Relapse is then viewed as a normal part of the cycle, but that the individual may not have them. Termination, an individual will graduate and move on with life. The average is between six months and two years seeking meetings. However, lifetime membership or attendance is not mandatory or encouraged. This dis decision is viewed as an individual choice. There you have it. So each group, um, both groups and self-help groups, have their own assumptions and then the way that they believe the nature of addiction. Professionals in the field should be prepared to help individuals interested in self-help groups find the best one that fits their needs.